How are we all this week? Good, uh, and I promised you in the schedule a guest lecturer for this week, and we actually have a very good one resident here at Griffith University. And we'll run it as a little bit of a QA. and a um, We have Dean Gould, who is communications director for the whole of Griffith University. So he's madly dealing with media inquiries and um, doing, well, he'll tell you about his, his role there. But Dean and I have known each other since really the early 1990s, um, before uh, many of you existed on this earth. And uh, that was back when I used to do a bit of training for what was then called Rural Press, which is uh, now owned by Fairfax Media. And Dean was an editor uh, for one of their newspapers. He'll give you his full <coughs> career uh, path at the time. And Dean's journalism and editing career over that period since then, uh, you know, has taken him to um, it's taken him to Fairfax uh, as an editor of a startup central coast of New South Wales um, newspaper in a very competitive environment there, where I think all three major newspaper groups were competing for the same territory. It's taken him to um, to Ireland uh, independently to work on a newspaper there. It's taken him with it's taken him with News Corporation to uh, for a stint at the New York Post. Some of you will have read about the editor-in-chief of the New York Post, Col Allen, being in Australia at the moment, um, uh, you know, supervising the, giving some editorial control to the uh, tabloid newspaper editors. And it eventually took Dean to the Gold Coast Bulletin, uh, where he became editor of the Bulletin. And one of the main reasons I've asked him to speak with you today is that he's known throughout industry as a pioneer of audience engagement. He basically reshaped or established the presence of the Gold Coast Bulletin online through the Gold Coast Online website. But probably more importantly in my own mind was him being a pioneer of SMS text publication. By engaging readers, and with this newspaper, particularly the trades-oriented readers, um, through publishing their text messages about all and sundry issues and calling for them to be engaged with their SMS messaging. Sometimes there were pages and pages of SMS messages from readers because they were so fired up about a topic. And it was a way a local newspaper editor was able to engage with a section of the community that was sometimes quite alienated from newspapers as an industry. Dean has left there and has come here since, but my first question to Dean would be really, that's just a little nutshell thing, there could be some inaccuracies there, Dean, if you don't mind just tracking your career for the students. Yeah, look, I think, thank you very much for having me today, I really appreciate it, and thanks for the invitation, Mark. Um, I think uh, it was pretty accurate. Uh, I feel really excited for you guys, because it doesn't seem that long ago that I was in the same uh, seats that you were sitting in, not, not this theatre, but uh, at university and looking forward to a career in journalism and media and, and, and as it turns out, public relations. So it's, it's, it's a really, really exciting field to be in. It lead, you, if, you, if you take advantage of the opportunities, it's a really interesting life. Uh, and I often say that I've, 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 I've led a life I don't deserve because I've had entree into some really amazing places and met some amazing amazing people purely because I was a journalist. Um, I started as a cadet in Western Queensland, uh, left university and went to uh, this cadetship, had a lot of fun out there, uh, played a lot of sport, drank way too much beer, um, then uh, I moved to uh, another small newspaper and then from there I was, uh, I think every, all of us want at some stage in our career to have a mentor or someone to take you under their wing and say actually we think you've got something uh, worth developing and I was lucky enough to get that when I was at Rural Press and at 26 I was given my first job as an editor, uh, it was in Ipswich and then uh, from there I went on to uh, other editors roles and then uh, one day I just decided I was going to go and play rugby in Ireland and uh, quit everything. Everyone uh, was um, uh, concerned that I had a sort of a, a mental snap or something, but I just decided this is the one thing. I got to about 30 and I thought if I was ever going to play competitive rugby, if I was ever going to play rugby overseas, I had to play when I was competitive. 
And so I went over there and uh, I threw my uh, mouth garden boots in my backpack and uh, I was lucky, I did play rugby over there, but I was lucky enough that the, the, the great part of playing in Ireland was uh, that I got a really, really good job over there. Ended up with uh, the Irish Examiner, which is a national uh, paper over there. In fact, all my, my metro experience in the media has been overseas at New York or in Ireland. <coughs> And um, uh, spent about 15 months there, then uh, came back to Australia, joined APN. I had a very successful uh, time with APN, uh, won the Australasian Newspaper of the Year, the Pamper Awards, uh, a couple of times with them, so I was very proud of that. And uh, then uh, I w again, it was funny how things, uh, the merry-go-round merry comes around, because the guy who, who sort of championed my cause when I was at Royal Press as a, as a young journalist, he had then gone on to be the CEO of, um, of Fairfax Regionals and he rang me out of the blue one day and said uh, we want you to come and be the foundation editor of this um, startup newspaper and I think, I think it's the last newspaper to ever be started in Australia. Um, and looking back on it now, it was 2002, and why anyone wanted to start a newspaper in the 21st century, I don't know. But we did, and it was a lot of fun, and there was, uh, it was a hugely competitive environment because uh, Fairfax launched straight into News Limited Territory, which is around Gosford and Terrigal and that uh, Woi Woi area. Um, and so it, it, it attracted all their, uh, all their attention. And the poor community went from having, I think it was three editions of a newspaper each week, there was a bi-weekly and a weekly, to having something like like 21 editions of newspapers uh, because we were six days a week. The um, Telegraph launched six days a week, uh, Central Coast edition. The, um, uh, the bi-weekly went daily, uh, so that was 15, 16, um, 18, there's 18 editions a week. So this poor uh, community was inundated with newspapers. It was the last real newspaper war and that was a lot of fun. But then uh, I got to the, the, the budget session with Fairfax and, um, and I don't mind them saying this because it's basically on the record. Uh, they had no plan for the Central Coast. There was no plan to expand it. There was no plan to disband it. They just were hoping that it would continue and I thought, oh, I need a little more strategy to my, uh, to my uh, um, editorial career than that. Uh, so then I, I looked around and I decided I wanted to come to the Gold Coast and I made an approach to the editor-in-chief of the Gold Coast, Bulletin Bob Gordon, who has turned out to be a great, long and dear friend of mine. And um, it's funny enough, I'll tell you how I got that job there. We met at uh, Rabina Town Centre for a coffee and he looked me up and down and he goes, do you play rugby? And I said, yeah, I do. And uh, we talked for an hour and a half about rugby and at the end of it he said, so when can you start? So um, sometimes, he, he could, he'd done all his homework before, he figured I, I knew what I was doing as a journalist and he just wanted to make sure I was going to fit into his newsroom as, uh, culturally and, uh, and, uh, and be a, a right-hand man to him. Uh, fortunate enough to have followed him as editor of the um, Gold Coast Bulletin when he retired. But in between that, I did a stint at uh, the New York Post, which um, Mark uh, mentioned, which was heaps of fun, working with Kyle Allen, um, living in New York and walking through Times Square every, way, every day to go to work. That was pretty cool. And uh, I also I was commissioned, when I came back from New York, I was commissioned to start up the digital side of the Gold Coast um, Publications business. And um, Rocky Miller, who's the general manager or the CEO of uh, Gold Coast Publications, then he said to me, he said, you like this internet stuff, don't you? And I said, yeah, I love it. I was a real sort of, I was very fascinated by it. And he said, uh, I want you to start up an online business for us. And I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I have no idea, but you've got three months. So uh, three months later, we launched goldcoast.com.au and uh, it's um, by far and away still the number one website on the Gold Coast, uh, daylight second. Um, it was for a long time the uh, fastest growing website in News Limited and probably the only one that actually made money um, uh, for a long time. Uh, things have probably changed a lot now but in those early days that was, uh, that was the case. And then I got to a point where I was working sort of 16 hour days uh, most days of the week, or to be honest 14 hour days most days of the week and uh, I have a young family or a younger family, they um, are three boys and they were just hitting their teenage years. Uh, I was working on Sundays as well and uh, an opportunity, I'd done a lot of work with Griffith, um, we collaborated on a number of projects and uh, an opportunity came up to join Griffith as uh, Director of Communications here. They were looking to really up the ante in their media 
uh, profile. They approached me and um, after a little bit of um, soul searching I said yes. Knowing full well it was a career change and that was, that was a really interesting time for me because um, once, I'd, uh, once I'd made the decision I felt really at peace with this and I've had nothing but fun since I've been here which is great. Um, so there you go, that that's brings you up to uh, today. Which uh, uh, And then the great thing is you sort of keep coming across uh, these colleagues like Mark as, uh, as you intersect through the community. And someone said to me a long time ago, um, uh, newspapers are a small village uh, and you, you come across the same people all the time, so, which is great. All right, well, excuse me <coughs> invading your body space here, but uh, right. just so the lecture capture people can hear my questions. Uh, the subject's called online news production, and thanks so much for that, uh, that career snapshot. Uh, your career was pretty much in newspapers, although you were at the edge with online journalism, uh, particularly towards the end there. These people are entering a career where newspapers in their print form, uh, perhaps not the companies, but the newspapers in their print form are on, on the decline, and they're confronted with producing their own news blogs in, in this subject. So would you mind just talking through from your own experience, particularly with Gold Coast Online, um, how that's different and, and, and what they need to be looking for in presenting finding, in presenting news on their news blogs. Yeah, sure. I think the big thing is that um, anything in print uh, is one way. I decide what you're going to read. And you read it, you like it or you don't read it, or, or you, you don't like it and you don't read it. It's very, very simple. But in the online space, and this uh, comes back to the whole SMS um, uh, project that we launched on the Gold Coast Bulletin, um, you've, you, it's a two-way street. And that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a one for one conversation, but I need the opportunity to, to join in with your storytelling because what you're talking about here, whether it be print, online, broadcast, uh, blogging, it's storytelling. And the big difference now is that the storytelling is more communal. You, you, you have to engage your audience and they want to, they want to say, I love that, I hate that, um, what about this, uh, check out this website as well. Um, you're talking drivel or you know, you just inspired me. One of those sort of things. And <clears throat> I think that's the biggest, biggest difference. So, and to get that engagement, you need to be really precise about what you're saying. Uh, if it's a long, rambling, um, uh, uh, broad-based uh, blog or story, people can't engage because you haven't actually hit on anything. I mean, it's like a conversation at a, at a, uh, a dinner party or, or just a, a regular party. If you've got someone who just talks and talks and talks and talks and talks and talks, you just can't wait to get away from them, can you? So if you've got someone who's really precise and engaged and has a specific opinion about something, you find yourself you know, focused in on that person, asking questions, and, and, and sometimes the conversation goes off on tangents, but it's very precise. So my, my big advice is to be very uh, precise in what you're doing in the online environment. And that worked for the SMS area as well. It was, it was an early way of us to get instant gratification for our readers. When you, because newspapers are a one-way street, you read something and say, that's ridiculous. That, how can he only get six months for that crime? And you say, well, whatever your opinion, SMS, SMS us now. So people would have a, a chance to, to vent. Um, and I remember the, the time when Chappelle Corby, who's uh, in uh, an Indonesian prison, she got, um, when she was arrested and, and given 20 years jail, I think we ran something like eight pages of outrage from our readers. Just, you know, 20, 30 character SMSs. Um, uh, some of them saying, you know, rotten hell, you're a drug dealer. Some of them saying, how can I do that? Um, I, re I remember one of them, and I only say this because it's funny. Um, um, I think you're guilty, but you're a hottie, so I hope you get off. Uh, <laughs> and, and like that was, it was a, a market that we, we aimed at, which was the tradies market, and it worked really, really well. Um, there was another time when we started up a, uh, an SMS campaign regarding service on the Gold Coast, and that one hit a nerve as well. We had pages and pages of people complaining about the level of service, whether it be um, in an office, in a cafe, in a restaurant, uh, wherever they were going, and that, that was a really uh, unusual one to get engagement out of, but it, it was a specific topic. If we just ran an SMS campaign and said, tell us what you think today, yeah, you probably wouldn't get that sort of engagement, but it was a very, very precise, honed in, one subject, one answer, tell us what you think. And that's really important in the online space, I think.
<laughs> Online has all of these advantages, but in your job as communications director, I'm presuming you're mainly dealing with traditional media and their traditional approaches to a story. Um, are there any good examples where a story at Griffith has lent itself to multimedia treatment and media organisations have wanted to pursue that? Uh, yes, definitely. And, and in fact, more and more we're dealing with non-traditional media. Uh, our own channels are really, really important. The whole social media space, uh, we've increased our, our, our footprint as a, as a, in a media sense by more than 100% in the last 12 months. Uh, we've launched our own YouTube channel, which is going gangbusters. We're pushing out uh, VNRs, video news releases, to uh, broadcast stations now. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more going on than, than the traditional sort of um, uh, media uh, channels, if you like. But one of the ones most recently that uh, I think works very, very well is when the um, election was announced by uh, Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister Gillard at the beginning of the year. We have some terrific political commentators and so we would, um, and, and they're pretty frequently in the news. So a lot of the journos know their numbers or know that they're available and uh, in fact while Mark and I were having a coffee before this I got a call from the ABC looking for someone to talk on something else. So that, that sort of stuff happens all the time. So we, uh, we pushed out our, our political commentators through, um, through the normal channels. We did a media release. We want to post that media release on our website. Um, then we promote the fact that these um, comments have been made through our social media channels. Um, and then we'd also do something on video, just to, uh, you know, predictions from our political commentators about how the election might unfold. Um, the next thing we know, we got a call from Fairfax. They want to do an uh, interview with uh, one of our political commentators, uh, a professor in, um, in um, politics and journalism, actually. Paul Williams. Yeah, Paul Williams. And uh, you may um, do classes with him, I'm not sure. And uh, so. The next phase, and, and this is increasingly common, Fairfax have this uh, web TV or Fairfax TV which is a web based uh, video and we were able to offer them the technology where they could, uh, we would um, uh, film, film Paul at our end, they would ask questions via a speakerphone or an iPhone on speaker and uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, embellish the interview at all. Uh, we, we were just the conduit to getting it to them. Then we send them the final version and they, uh, they edit it to their, to their uh, liking and it goes up. So you know, we're, we're really moving into that space where we're becoming the, the mechanics of the interview because of the tyranny of distance and that sort of thing. And I think that's a really interesting evolution of where it's at. Because in the old days they would have had to send a crew out, you know, they, would have been, uh, they would have pushed the PR people out of the way, we don't want you anywhere near us. But now it's um, because of resource issues more than anything, they're, they're embracing the fact that we can uh, fast track the mechanics of the interview for them. So um, I've been talking to students and actually today in the tutorials they'll be, those who haven't done so will be at least registering their WordPress blogs and so on and uh, there's lots of bells and whistles that they can have there on their blogs. Um, but how important still are the, what we might call the traditional journalism skills of um, verifying information, um, you know, attributing it properly, um, seeking out and talking to real live sources? I think that's critical. That's absolutely critical. And that's, that sets you apart from the rest of the World Wide Web. That sets you apart from all the drivel and, and uh, self-approved commentary that's out there. There's way heaps of that. No one needs any more of that stuff. What you need to do is give them something they didn't know before. And that doesn't just mean your opinion. That means you have to give them something that they can rely on, that they go, wow, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Uh, and that they can take forward as a fact, as a, as a concrete fact. If, uh, if you don't give them something different and something fresh and something uh, reliable, then what are you giving them? You may as well just put on Facebook, you know, um, I'm so tired. You know, that's, that's about as, as the depth that you're, you're, uh, you're operating at. So it's really, really important that you, if, you, if you're presenting um, information on your blogs, that it be absolutely verified. And it's easy to do. There's so many ways to verify things. The most important way is to talk to people. The thing about journalism, whether it's print, online, Twitter, Facebook, WordPress blogs, it's storytelling. 
It's storytelling. We're the, we're, you are the next generation of great storytellers. It's so exciting. But you've got to st tell the story. And it's not your story. It's got to be someone else's story. Um, because our stories get boring after a while. So, so you can tell your, your own story once and that's it. Um, but so you, you, you've just got to talk to people. And if you're nervous about talking to people, then seriously, either get over it or find something else to do because journalism is talking to people. That's the most important thing. Get their stories. Well, that's, that's terrific, Dean. Um, one of the things I admired about you when you were the bulletin editor was the amount of time you were willing to spend with the cadets. Now, people don't become a cadet at a newspaper accidentally. You've got your best and brightest young uh, journalism graduates or journalism students that are there that get these positions. But nevertheless, um, you would still run little training yeah. sessions with them. So just thinking back over those sessions and the sorts of things that were hardest to drill into young journalists, would you mind just talking about one or two of those and, and the, sort of the tips you would have um, so that these people might avoid the same mistakes? Yeah, I think um, the hardest thing when you're a cadet is you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so my big tip is, Assume everyone knows more than you, because uh, one of the, the great cliches of, of newspapers is better to, better to be form, uh, thought of a fool by the one person you're talking to than proven to be a fool by the 30,000 papers that get printed tomorrow. So you can't make a mistake. So if, if I say, is that Mark with a K, and you think, well, how else is it? Then, okay, he might think I'm a, I'm a fool for asking an obvious question, but I'll get it right. And I don't write Mark with a C in the paper tomorrow or on the blog tonight. I get it right. And that's the most important thing. So just assume everyone knows more than you and ask the dumb question. Because I'd much rather be thought um, uh, pedantic or, or a bit dim by the person I'm interviewing than proven a bit dim uh, tomorrow or, or whenever someone reads my blog. Um, so that's the main thing. The, the, other, the other thing that was, it still drives me nuts is when, when you see a story half done and you'll say, okay, so did you ask this, this and this? I oh, know he didn't say, didn't say, he didn't say. And that's code for I didn't ask him, I didn't think of that. Um, so promise me in your careers you'll never say to your editors or your news editors or your chief of staff, oh, I didn't say, I didn't say. Because I didn't say, you didn't ask them. And if you didn't ask them, then you didn't think of it. So if a, if a senior journalist or a senior um, newspaper or news executive comes up to you and says, did they say this, this or this, and you haven't asked the question, go back to them. Oh, that's great. I didn't think of that. I'll ring them straight back. Or I'll, I'll go back and see them. Or I'll make another appointment or whatever it might be. But the, uh, just because they didn't say it doesn't mean that it's not a valid um, piece of information. And uh, I, I think it's the most important thing to, to remember is that it's your job to get the story. It's not their job to tell it. One of the most difficult questions I ever get asked these days, and I'm supposed to know about it, um, but I'm going to ask you, uh, with the, really, the demise of traditional newspapers, um, can you yet see anything for the journalism, journalism as a career that's filling that gap that provides um, an, an optimistic view for future employment for journalism graduates? Yeah, I can. And I can see it starting to happen now. Um, so what year are we here? Final. Mm. Final year? Okay. The next 12 months are still going to be a bit dim, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, so if you, if, if you struggle in the next 12 months, it's not you, it's the industry. Since 2008, there's been this massive contraction in what you would call conventional journalism. The, the days of the big newsrooms, you know, the 200 journos in a newsroom, I think those days are gone forever. But what I'm seeing a lot of already is uh, lots of smaller niche subject um, news providers pop up. And, and by that I mean people like Griffith University. I have a team of five or six who write news about Griffith. Um, and they're all ex-journos. Um, I see it in uh, more and more in the PR world. Uh, they're looking for genuine content rather than that old-fashioned spin. I mean, the old-fashioned spin, I think people are just over now. So they're looking for genuine content, whether it be about mining, whether it be about 
a mate of mine works for a, a, um, a motoring magazine and writes about tyres. Now he's a car nut, he loves it. Um, but it's genuine journalism and it, for that niche area. So the, the, the days of um, broad generalist journalism I think have, have certainly contracted and I don't know whether they'll ever expand again. But the idea of specialist um, smaller two, three, four, five, six member teams across different industries, I can see that sprouting all over the place already. And I think that's really interesting. So the challenge for you is where do you want to start this specialisation, if, if that's where the employment opportunities are, and how then do you transition from one to the other and perhaps into a general uh, newsroom at some stage. Um, so the, the, the storytelling techniques become so critical so that you can move into any subject area and tell a story about that subject area. Yeah? How do you, um, sort of like, if you talk about setting up a niche publication or whatever, how do you make, sorry, how do you make money off that if everyone's putting out a lot of content? Just repeat the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, if you're setting up a niche publication, how do you make money out of it everyone, if everyone else is sort of um, uh, publishing in the same area? Well, what we're finding is that the, um, the, the need to... Uh, get information out there hasn't diminished at all. Um, I mean, the, the, inf the information overload that we're all experiencing means that the, the on-topic message that I was actually referring to before, that reliable, accurate, interesting, fresh information, that's really, really valuable. And what we're finding is organisations are investing in getting that material out. They see it as, a, as, as important as any other part of their marketing or, or business function. Um, so you're seeing a lot of, uh, certainly public sector's always done it, but the private sector's saying, well, we need someone to champion our cause in a content sense, not in a PR sense, in a content sense. And so they're saying, well, let's put on a journo who can write stories about us and largely publish on their own channels. So there's a reference point. So you're not at the mercy of whether the, the newspaper, which is, is reducing size, can fit your story in or not. Or you're not at the mercy of the TV station, which has you know, a, a staff of three or four, can get to your event. So they're publishing through their own channels and you're seeing it more and more. Um, it's genuine journalism. It's just not mass market journalism. So um, what's the name of the student who just asked that question? Sure. Sorry? John. Joel? Yeah. John. 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 So please give John a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John's a real journalist because he's, he's had a pressing question and he's put his hand up and asked it. Um, and that's what we do as reporters. So well done. Yeah. Um, the, just, just before we started, I mentioned to you some of the unpredictable consequences of new media. And it was because I was looking up your LinkedIn page and down the side it says viewers of this profile also viewed those people. Right? So um, and you know just as an aside I suppose that's the company you're keeping hmm. on LinkedIn. Yeah. So when someone sees you they see that that's your kind of if not friendship group they're your kind of peers that other people will be looking at at the same time. In your director of communications role, dealing with the use of social media, academics profiles on LinkedIn, YouTube uploads, <coughs> do you have any little um, stories or anything you recall where social unintended consequences of this new media have created a few headaches? Um, touch wood. It hasn't actually happened to me um, in my role here at Griffith, but there is a very, very interesting one that happened to a, a colleague at Curtin University. And um, what, it, uh, what it does, um, it, it, it amplifies the, the issue, whatever it is, beyond your control. And he, he really struggled to, uh, to know what to do because it caught him by surprise. Very, very standard university story. A, um, a visiting dignitary received a doctorate of, uh, a, a sort of an honorary doctorate at the university, a DNU, a DUN, sorry. Um, so they posted this up, but she happened to be the, I think it was the wife of the Malaysian Prime Minister. And, and clearly so they'd had a long connection with her through the, through the university, and there may have been donations there, I'm not sure, I really don't know. Uh, but as you know, there's a, a fairly um, um, uh, split. Um, political uh, realm within uh, Malaysia and 
a lot of people started saying how this is outrageous, we're politically opposed, you know, there's human rights abuses, they won't do this, they won't do that, um, you know, elections are a sham. And this just went nuts, it went wildfire on their Facebook page. And the, the unintended consequence was that they were putting up a, an announcement for their university, which they thought was for the university community, but of course you can watch, you can look up a Facebook page anywhere in the world. So the Malaysian um, diaspora and also the Malaysian um, uh, residents who opposed this particular uh, uh, woman's politics, um, they made it a cause and they shared it around. They, and if I share your comment with my followers, then they share it with their followers and it, it quickly goes exponential. Uh, so that the, the unintended consequence, and in the end they had to shut down their, their comments page, which is an extraordinary uh, step to take. Uh, but it just went on for a couple of days and, that was, and there, was no, there was no win for the universe. So they tried all the, all the normal uh, avenues saying, okay, we've, everyone's had their say, because as you know, universities are very much about free speech. So they let, them, they let this debate go on. Uh, and they said, okay, everyone's had their say, let's calm down now. And it just wouldn't stop, so they ended up turning it off. Um, so the unintended consequence was that they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't take into account, as you wouldn't, the um, internationalisation of everything that goes into the digital world. Mm. And, and I wonder, um, <coughs> that's, that's interesting also that in, in the shift from um, journalism to PR, um, you, and while, you, while you're saying you know, there's less spin, I suppose, there's more just providing content today, um, I suppose that's an example of where the PR role is kind of under threat with new media because PR has traditionally been associated with control. They've yeah. been able to basically shut down an issue or refuse to speak on an issue or um, just um, you know, issue a statement and everything's controlled within that or choose not to release it until after the media's deadline. Yep. Whereas when you have hashtags where people can say whatever they like on Twitter or, or Facebook postings, it's created a new world that way. So how does a PR executive deal with that unpredictability, the McDonald's hashtag, the Qantas hashtag that were famous examples of social media going wrong? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question, and um, it, it's funny that I find myself in, in PR these days. Um, for about the first six or eight months in this role, I call myself in communications because I couldn't quite cope with PR. Um, now I'm quite happy to be called PR. Um, and, and communications is part of public relations, and I, I'm very proud of that now. The, um, and in the early part of my career, I, found, I felt the two were uh, almost the, you know, the anathema of each other. You know, one was about exposing the truth and one was about distorting it. And, uh, and I have a much more mature view of it now because um, public relations is a, is a really interesting and, and rewarding area. But in terms of your specific question about how do you deal with that unpredictability, um, I, I encourage uh, all I can do is advise at this stage um, and, and our senior staff. I, I encourage transparency uh, for two reasons. One is it's it's philosophically right thing to do, but the other thing is the news cycle moves so fast that if you if you try to stave off the news cycle, all you're going to do is prolong it. Uh, and we've seen that in a, a lot of stories where people try to, um, you know, uh, deny stuff that's gone on. Um, you know, there's a couple of Queensland politicians in recent times. I think the Craig Thompson um, um, issue in New South Wales is a, is a good example of that, where there was this trying to just stonewall the issue for so long. And I think the, if, you can, if you can just put it all on the table, if you've done something wrong, if your company has done something wrong, if your organisation has done something wrong, fess up. Fess up and fix it. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, if you're... If you're being mistreated by the media, and that can happen, then like every individual has the right to say, no, not dealing with you, you have the right to say that to the media as well, if you're being mistreated. But if you're being treated fairly, um, then you know, my view is to be transparent and, um, and state your case. Uh, and not everything's black and white, so sometimes you know, you'll have an opinion over here that you disagree with, you put opinion here, and it, it's just, they just have to sit alongside each other. You're not going to be able to control it. Sure. Well, Dean, if, if you um, left this position and you were choosing to start a news blog, 
that might be of interest for which you wanted to attract sponsorship, advertising, or perhaps some other means of, of fundraising for it. Um, and bear in mind, some of these students have such great ideas and have already pitched the fact that they wouldn't mind their blog continuing longer term. But if you were creating your own news blog tomorrow, separate from Griffith University or the Gold Coast Bulletin, what might it be? How might you generate interest in it? What um, sort of content might it have? How would you attract dollars to feed your young family? There's a couple of things I'll, I'll advise, and it's not to do with journalism, but it's really, really important in this digital space. Um, I'm not sure, Mark, do you, in the online production um, subject, do you touch on SEO? Yes, we already have. Okay, so, well, well great, great, because uh, search engine optimization is a really, really crucial tool for the 21st century journalist. You've, you, and uh, uh, there's a huge proportion of the current media industry who still don't get it. So if you're across it, you've got an advantage. Well, only um, to the extent of certain headline terms, um, being <coughs> specific and, uh, and matching the short, um, search terms. Um, yep. We've only sort of hinted at uh, potential for, um, you know, um, hidden um, uh, search uh, you know, uh, assistance being there, uh, as in the um, descriptors. Yep. The tagging and, that, and so on. Mm. But they all add up. They all add up and they're all very important. So if, you, if your particular online blog might be about... Um, I don't know, selling, uh, selling sunglasses online for some reason, um, or it might be about sunglasses or, or fashion wear or something like that, then you've got to do a keyword analysis. What, where is your audience? Just like if you were starting up a radio station, you'd say, okay, where's the audience and where are we going to broadcast to? If you're starting up a newspaper with a particular angle on your newspaper, whether it be an age demographic or a, or a um, geographic dem demographic, you say, okay, where's the audience? The same in the online space. You say, okay, I want to sell, sell fashion apparel. Where's the audience? And you find the audience, the, the audience is not geographic, as I pointed out with that uh, example about the Facebook page with um, uh, the Malaysian um, woman. The, the audience is determined by like-mindedness, not like location. And so you need people who are going to be interested in fashion apparel, obviously. How do you find that? Well, then you do a Google keyword analysis. Um, you can sign up for a free trial. If you're only doing uh, one, um, one um, blog or one area, you can actually do it all for free. If, you want to, if you're a big company, you want to do lots of them, and it's going to cost you. But you can actually sign up for a free trial, and you can say, OK, if I wanted to buy fashion accessories. You type in those keywords, it'll give you an analysis of what other keywords uh, work in that environment. You then build your um, WordPress blog or your website or your digital presence around that. Um, and then your, your SEO, your search engine optimization, has to be driven by that knowledge. Uh, so your content uh, is driven by that knowledge, your headlines are driven by that knowledge, and, your, and the other important thing is to add fresh content. Google loves fresh content. So if you're updating your blog every week or every day or every hour, whatever it might be, loves fresh content. That's the technical side of it. That's, that's really, really important because no matter how good your product is or your writing is, if you don't get that right, no one's going to find you. It's like having a, a great shop with no front window. You know, you've got, to, you've, you've got to have that right. Then the other thing is, I go back to what I said before, be precise, be uh, reliable, be accurate, be interesting, be fresh. Because if you've got that, then uh, you're not going for a generalist audience. You know, if you want to start up a travel website, you wouldn't just put in travel as your, um, uh, as your keyword. I mean, who, who types in travel? You know, if, you know, uh, boat cruise down Mekong River, that's what people try to type in. So you've got to be that precise. And this is where journalism is, comes into its own in an, in an online sense because it has to be precise to be good. So you can be really precise about a particular topic and drive your keywords that are precise and drive your questions that are precise provide interesting interviews, interesting talk to interesting people. It can't just be you thinking out loud. There's enough of that on the internet. It's got to be good interviews, good storytelling, driven by the mechanics of SEO and keywords. Hmm. Well, my final question, and I'll leave five minutes for others, 
In this subject, the students aren't obliged to work alone or in groups. In fact, they can be a, a lone wolf, a dynamic duo, or a dream team. Most of them have chosen to be lone wolves. When I say most, the most popular choice uh, has been to be a lone wolf. What do you, in this new environment of news blogging and multimedia and boutique interests and all the rest of it, what do you see as the advantages of working alone as distinct from joining up with other people? Um, working alone, is, it's, it's pretty much something that has, I think, evolved with the digital environment um, because you can't both use a keyboard at the same time. So one person has to drive the car. You can't, you can't, the four of you, you know, it's very frustrating to have three people sitting over your shoulders, you're typing something, saying, no, 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 change that word, change that word, change that word. So there's a real sort of efficiency about working alone. Uh, you can say, I'm gonna do this now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Um, and the, the whole um, evolution of particularly social media is it's all about you. You know, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn page, your Twitter page, how many followers do you have? Uh, so there's this almost a culture of being a single entity in the digital space. Now, I think a bit of collaboration goes a long, long way. I still think that you know, having an, another person, another couple of people to bounce ideas off, to uh, do some of the, the legwork that's involved, because um, the, the work involved in doing a website or a, or a blog really well is, is pretty demanding. Uh, and once you've got your content right and once you've got your multimedia right and once you've got your content right and you've done your interviews and you've written the story and all that sort of stuff, then you've got to distribute it. And you've got to distribute it through um, uh, your social media channels, your Google Plus uh, accounts, whatever they might be. And that takes a lot of time. And I know firsthand how long it takes. So if you've got four or five other subjects going on, that's, um, if you've got people to share that load, I, I would certainly encourage that because to do it properly takes a lot of time. Hmm. Thanks, Dean. And I'd add to that some of them have special skills that others don't have, and they might be able to. Someone might be a photojournalist or a uh, or a great long-form creative non-fiction writer, and uh, they can draw upon those skills. But nevertheless, some will be very good doing it as um, as lone wolves. All right, we still have um, six minutes remaining, and so I'll open it up to other questions. So, who's who's got a question of um, of the maestro, the guru? <laughs> Remember, it is a journalism class, and uh, we have to pepper a guest with questions. So, thank you. Yes. Um, going back to what you were saying before about um, like niche markets and stuff, um, you, just to clarify, you're basically saying that certain niche markets have become legitimised in the journalist industry. Um, I don't know if I'd use the word legitimised, but. Um, they, they've, they've become um, content producers uh, because they, they've, the, the people running those, those niche markets or the people involved in those niche markets haven't been able to get their voice out through a, a decreasing um, uh, mainstream media. So they've said, okay, well, what else can we do? And I think the advent of social media over the last eight or ten years has also said, well, hang on, there's a whole audience out here in Facebook land or Twitter land or uh, Tout land. Is anyone across Tout? You in, across Tout? No, no. Have a look at it, tout.com. It's, um, it's uh, Twitter for video, 15-second videos. Oh, okay. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Uh, sorry? Yeah. Similar, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, the difference is that Tout has, seems to be adopted by most of the American broadcasters oh, okay. as their um, followers on Tout, that sort of stuff. Um, so there's, there's a, um, a whole lot of other channels. They're saying, well, hang on, we don't, it, it was, used to be such a big thing to get, you know, page seven in the Courier Mail or whatever it might be, your, your article or your content mentioned there. That's still really important and it, doesn't, it hasn't diminished at all, but there's a whole lot of other areas. So I don't see it as a, an either or. Um, so I don't know that legitimise would be the word, um, but it's, it's certainly the um, multiple voices now, definitely. I remember we chose um, Ben Dilloway. Uh, I'm not sure if you were on yep. that selection at no, the time. No, I wasn't, but I know yeah. Ben. Yep. Uh, as a cadet at the Bulletin. And 
Ben uh, had made something like 20,000 a year in his last couple of years of high school um, taking action photos of um, motocross, um, like, I think it might have been BMX bicycles, but anyway, yeah. um, some um, dirt riding sport. Um, do you think that kind of specialty interest has so much more potential now online, uh, as in uh, selling sponsorship into that kind of yeah. specialty area? Yeah, I, I do, and I think the the big thing is that it's got to be good, it's got to be different, it's got to be fresh, it's got to be reliable. I'll just repeat those 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 things because you know anyone can take a photo on their iPhone. We've all started to watch a YouTube um, uh, clip and thought, oh, that's rubbish, and turned it off. It's got to be good. So. All right, one last question, and we had one over here. Someone had put their hand up there a little bit earlier. Yes, yeah. Who was it? Who was? Yes, I did. I did a, I did a Bachelor of Arts in, uh, at University of Queensland and I did, um, uh, I did enough subjects in journalism. I did, I did what would have been a journalism major, but um, for whatever reason I decided to make sociology my major, um, um, maybe because it was a bit more broad based, but uh, I did um, three years of journalism, just like you. Uh, but it was a Bachelor of Arts in those days. And in those days, journalism was part of the government and politics um, faculty. It wasn't, it wasn't even its own school in those days. Um, and then some years later, I did my MBA in um, marketing and HR. So. All right, well, I've certainly learned a lot today, so uh, I'm sure you have as well. So please join me in thanking Dean Gould. As a